And welcome to this episode of TF. It is me, Riley. Uh, Milo is safely hived off in Edinburgh mm-hmm. in the TF temporary. I'm in Edinburgh. It's me, David Tennant. Milo. North TF North Encampment. We also have yeah. Alice the, in Glasgow. What the fuck does that make me then? The longer t- established <laughs> TF France North. Says Beg me. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Your well, TF North Encampment brackets slightly rougher. Yeah. No. You're Francis, the t- Francis with an E because you're trans. Francis Begbie. Francis Begbie is from Force Edinburgh. Force Begbie. From Edinburgh. In- <laughs> oh wait. Sorry. Yeah, that's correct. He has a Glasgow vibe, but he is from Edinburgh. <laughs> you are not the encampment. You are the permanent tower base. You're the, you're listen, the I, I, I tanked all of the times that Hussein called spitting image, splitting image, but like I have a limit on the number of times we can say that urban Welsh characters how are many times Glaswegian. Like, wait, how many yeah, times you're, you're, do you do that? You, once, <laughs> you never once called it spitting image. <laughs> You call it never every time. time. Every time. Every time. All, I imagine it might be quite inconvenient. <laughs> oh, buddy. Uh, no, I <laughs> genuinely every time, and you can go back and you can listen on the recording. And every time there is, is a, not a called- pause from me where I'm considering whether or not to say something, and I just leave you to it. Oh my okay. god. Okay. Yeah. So however, I'm having a moment. However, just destroyed Hussein's confidence in the in the first minute. Uh, how are we all doing? Yeah. yeah I'm- well, how we're doing is I want to introduce our guest for the day. It is returning get returning champion, possibly our most frequent guest ever. Mm-hmm. It is none other than Patrick Wyman. Patrick, how's it going? I'm doing fantastic. How are you all doing? Great, yeah, better for having you on. <laughs> a pleasure to have in class. Mm. It's it's good to, it's good to be here. It's a frigid 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Ooh, uh, yeah. in Phoenix. Mm. Uh, looking forward to being inside for the next hour and uh, mm. not seeing the sun. Oh, Patrick perfect. Wyman is enjoying the free salmon and caviar blinis that only top gold tier <laughs> members of the Trash Future Lounge have access to. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, somehow is somehow uh, that delivery has not arrived, so yeah. I'll be I'll be keeping my eyes. Oh, out. it would it would perish pretty badly in that heat. I reckon. It <laughs> yeah, would be it's a not short good. Shelf life. It's, it's like pan seared, but in the truck. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's a limit of three per person anyway. It's not really worth it. Also, uh, I need to admit to something that I uh, have delayed this recording by approximately half an hour by being God's perfect oaf. However, mm. I also got to see the most exciting thing you can see in the London Underground, which is the little device they bring out when you drop your phone between the train and the platform. I love the device. I love the track <laughs> retrieval device. And so far, this pushes mm. us to two users of the track retrieval device hosting this podcast. And they are absolutely the two you would guess. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And apart from the one woman who wants to use it, <laughs> that's your curse, Atlas. That's You're right. like Oedipus. Yeah. Did you delay the trains at all? Because I can I can sort of imagine like someone like on the fucking central line or whatever is being really pissed off that you like ruined their journey because you did a, you had an oath moment. I, I, I really did, think yes. I'm more like Tantalus than Oedipus. I'm not really trying to like fuck my mum in order to use the track retrieval device. I I did in fact d- have to d- cause a train to arrive at another platform. Uh, so I got to wear the infrastructural version of a big dunce cap today, which is the guy, <laughs> the TFL guy with the grabber arm doing the thing, and another TFL guy comes down and waves people onto another platform, and I'm clearly the only non-TFL employee now on the platform. So everyone knows why, uh, why the, what oaf basically causes them to like be slightly You have my full sympathy. I, I would hate that. I'm too I'm too British for that situation. I'd be like, just leave the phone. Yeah, it's the train's <laughs> phone now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I can't handle the embarrassment. I'll eat the grand. <laughs> now that Patrick is here, you will probably have guessed that we're going to be talking about some historical parallels of uh let's say modern day indicators of collapse, which we have been oh. doing hmm. Uh, for we, a never, couple we years. never get you on to talk about nice things from history, do we? No. Well, this is, I mean, that's because history is mostly sad stories about bad people. And so yeah. if you want to talk about sad stories and bad people in the present, I'm, I'm the guy you call. Like, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> and this is something I've been thinking about for a while now, which is not just the ways that institutions sort of rot and crumble and stop working or the ways in which um, sort of system level disruptions can upset things like trade and, um, and, and social and political networks, uh, but how the specific psychological manias of elites 
uh, and elites who are desirous of protecting their own positions, who get uh, dogmatically ossified beliefs about the world and the world around them. Basically, how the core ossified, fossilized, dangerous beliefs uh, can lead to collapse and what history can tell us. Well, we talk often about how, you know, the, the, the fall of Rome, right, is not like a discrete event necessarily. It's a series of like logistical infrastructural things like, you know, uh, one day your, your, you know, your road isn't like maintained anymore or one day your train arrives at a different platform because someone has like thrown an iPhone onto the overground tracks. You know, and, and one day, you know, you think you're going to go to a market town somewhere in like what will become the English Midlands. And mm. all of a sudden, like maybe 50% of the people are transacting in coins and the other 50% are just bartering now mm -hmm. you know so this is what we're talking about we're we're not just talking about that kind of collapse we're go zeroing in on a specific dimension which is what you might call governing elites so not just rich people not just baristas uh, and not even necessarily ceos we mean people who make political or policy decisions about what the state does either directly or indirectly that's mp yeah, the swamp yeah our, our beloved swamp that's mps ministers wonks mandarins think tankers certain journalists and commentators opposition as well as government politicians, the people who we talk about as making up the kind of governing monolith. If we want to talk about failures, what we're talking about in the context of history, you can say, for example, you can look at the UK's failure to invest in anything uh, and compare that to the uh, American economic recovery, which like, love it or hate it, is in fact happening. People might not be feeling it, right? But the elite plan in the US did work for those elites. They've repaired what they needed, what they wanted to repair for themselves. Yeah, we're we're a pro IRA podcast. Yeah, Just... <laughs> uh, or uh, or um or the ongoing uh, failure to say invest in green energy, which might cause I don't know all of the treat networks that those elites love so well to collapse. I take right. issue with your assertion that the most exciting thing that could happen on the London Underground is the deployment of the track retrieval device. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think spicier <laughs> things could occur. <laughs> there are another few things here as well, right? The belief in the power of technology to perform magic unaided by people. The, the, the idea that a yeah. chatbot can replace certain elements of the NHS is a common core belief that unites everybody across every bit of the political spectrum in the UK if they have any power. Oh sure, we we've talked yeah. before about like the uh, the ideology of whatever we're guessing computationally in the future mm. is going to be called AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're also they're doing their best with the NHS to make those two ends meet by making the NHS so dysfunctional that an AI can do it. Like they've realised that they can't get an AI to run a functioning health service, but if you make the health service not work, you can get it to the point where an AI could do it as well. However, these are all examples of not just a failure of elites to govern for the people they're supposed to be governing for, it's a failure of elites to reproduce the society that makes them elites, right? This is two different kinds of failures. So the, the contrast between the US and the UK, I, I think is a really interesting one because the, the disconnect in the United States, I, I think politically, is between what people think the political system is supposed to do or who it's supposed to be for and who it's actually for. So the United States is run effectively by petty local elites who overlap to some not particularly significant degree with the kind of um, thin layer of centralized bureaucracy and, you know, government, like apparatus of government that resides in Washington, D.C. Like for the most part, the United States is run by local elites who are different from place to place, but tend to have fairly common interests that, you know, are usually channeled pretty effectively through both political parties, right? Like the, the, the IRA in the United States is a is just a, a bag full of goodies for um, for guys who own six McDonald's in Bakersfield, California. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like obviously, this varies from state to state. You know, in some states, this could be like a cabal of like you know Democrat DNC guys. In other states, it could be like a guy who owns a jet ski dealership. In a third state, it could be the Klan. But you know, it's, it it <laughs> forms a certain. Yeah, it's like it's it's former um, all state quarterbacks uh, turned car dealership owners in South Georgia. Right. Like that's this is the backbone of the American uh, of the American kind of petty elite. And they are incredibly well represented in all of the United States political institutions. 
Um, and if you realize that that's who American government is for, then this is all working out great. Like this is this this the the system is working pretty much as it's intended. It's a it is a, a series of systems to funnel treats to those people, right? I think in the UK there is more of a disconnect between kind of economic elites and political elites because of the 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 monolith of the of of the governing class and the way in which it the way in which it's built around specific sets of like feeder institutions right like i think there's more of a disconnect between that and what's happening in the localities and i think there is just straight up a bigger disconnect between the political center in the uk and the localities like if, if like Americans complain all the time about Washington, D.C., but the vast majority of politicking in the United States doesn't actually happen there. It happens in like golf courses in Orlando, you know, like that's those are political centers in the U.S. We made a beautiful deal. Well, it's a it's a nation of politically. It's a nation of comptrollers, essentially. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that is actually the reason that mafia guys love to be comptrollers is that gives you quite a bit of power. However, yeah, however. Right in the in the in the UK, we are not a nation of comptrollers. Is in fact a bunch of fake local government where mo most things actually happen in the center. However, yeah. as as you say, Patrick, that center is vastly more isolated than in the like uh, the example being, of course, the um, the birth of the frying pan chart phenomenon in the U.S., where you can see a, a bunch of the just decisions to invest. Again, I need to be clear here, right? Like, I'm not saying these are amazing, but like they are accomplishing the goals of the people who are who are governing, right? They're internally functional at least. And they were and and that was able to break what I've sort of start you could just call the Trump Obama consensus that there should be no investment in the in, in at all, right? That was broken, that managed to be broken so that the political elites could effectively serve the business elites interests. This is not happening in the UK. I like the Trump Obama consensus. That's very provocative of you. <laughs> it's I, I mean Trump honestly Obama I, consensus. It's the <laughs> it, it it is though. It's the it's the end of the kind of neoliberal consensus about mm. well we can't let government do too much because uh, honestly I think the turning point in the U.S. was the pandemic and especially the PPP program. All of the all of these like basically like infusions of free money if you could do even the most limited amount of paperwork and nobody was going to ask you what you did with the money ever like small business people and medium-sized business people and big business people all over all over the united states were like wait you mean we can just ask government to give us money directly and they'll do it and they'll never ask what we did with it like that awesome. has a way of changing people's ideas about 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 public investment where you're like universal mm -hmm. business income we did yeah, it. <laughs> it's fucking, it it's it's a fucking incredible accomplishment that they were just yeah. like oh fire hose of money and you know it worked out pretty well for pretty much everybody involved like the, the owner of the don't tread on me gun store somewhere in alabama just taking off his like libertarian hat and putting on his big like soviet ushanka for five minutes yeah. while he applies okay. to all of his free government money it's genuinely a very easy like way to own somebody on twitter is mm. anytime they talk about like small government you can look up their ppp loans and they're like oh the, you mm. know they had like five hundred thousand dollars from the federal government they've never paid it back and that you know the rationale they put on the form was like paper clips or whatever okay so yeah. I, I have to tell you about this operation this... paper clips <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i have to tell you about this particular character who i've been following on instagram for a while because i think he speaks directly to the heart of this this kind of transformation which i think you guys are rightly pointing out has happened in the united states there that's a pretty significant political shift that's taken place. There's okay, so there's a guy I follow. His he goes by the moniker Wall Street Weightlifter. He is an investment advisor. <laughs> uh, I love him already. Yes, he is an investment. Uh, he is an in investment advisor living somewhere in kind of like exurban California. He owns a CrossFit gym. He's just ridiculously strong, like stupid strong. Mm. Um, he can over pre overhead press like 405 pounds, which is nuts. Like that's wow. that's that's nuts. Like it's crazy. But anyway, his current personal peccadillo is the fact that the city that, that the city government of the excerpt where he lives got um, a bunch of money that was supposed to go to local businesses and then didn't. So this guy who you would think like 10 years ago is like a small government conservative, like a libertarian, right, is now yeah. going in front of the city council and complaining about how he didn't get his treat and how the other <laughs> business owners didn't get their treats. And like that right there, I think, is the political shift in a nutshell where these guys who were all like, oh, self-reliance, like we don't take anything from anybody, like government's bad, are now like, I want my treats too. Uh, this guy bursting through the wall of the city council chamber like the Kool-Aid man, just like <laughs> a man who weighs the best part of a ton, where money? 
<laughs> it's, it, that's that's kind of it. He has a mustache. Uh, he is like Wait, he's, he's like a Victorian strongman. Yeah, he's, he's in a like, leotard. He's lifting weights that say one hundred on them. Can he please be the episode art for this episode? And he's th- this guy is probably five foot seven and two hundred and sixty pounds, and yes. like with very same. little body fat and a giant <laughs> no, <not> mustache. Same. <laughs> yeah, kind like, of same. It's it's like it's it's incredible. But he's an incredible character because you can track the the development of the American business class's attitudes toward subsidies and government investment just through watching this guy get mad at a local city council meeting because he posts videos. It's like a video of him overhead pressing four hundred and five pounds, and then a video of him getting mad at the city council in the second. <laughs> and that's his Instagram feed. It's but, amazing. Fuck the bellwether state. We've got a bellwether big guy. Where, yes. where he goes, so goes the American and, voter. And this is the kind of person that that is the backbone of the American political elite. The upwardly mobile, jacked gym owner who's getting mad at the city council. Like this is this is America's political class, baby. Like if that guy opens a mm. chain of gyms, suddenly he's a state senator and he's represented in our institutions of power. That's how this works. I, I want to then bring this back to Britain, right? Because the question I want to answer in the next sort of 40 to 50 minutes is why did this fail to happen in Britain? And how can is we- it shit? Why and it's yeah. supposed how, to be shit. And how can mm. we locate that failure in the unique, isolated strangeness of the British elite? Well, I have a sort of a contrast, a contrast piece to this, which is uh, something I want to do in the next few weeks about local government spending that also has a guy in it. And it's sort of like this American's equivalent. And the short answer, the preview of that is they just take all of the money and fuck off to Dubai, right? They don't become a state senator. They just leave. Yeah, it's fucking nice. Yeah, no <laughs> no tax. Women aren't allowed to talk sick. <laughs> <laughs> We'll never have a London Stock Exchange weightlifter guy. No, he's, he's, not be, he's not gonna be here. He's in Dubai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, also, it does it link it links up with um something we've said on this show a lot, which is that, you know, the British government is the only truly right wing government on earth because they're the mm. only government that believes in the destruction of the state in its entirety. Like the American government only destroys the state insofar as it like ever helps the poor or anyone who needs services. It doesn't destroy the cops, the military, and the police. They understand that they need those three things, otherwise they won't be in charge anymore. Because Whereas the, the police, British government though. is like, no, 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 <laughs> we've got to get rid of it all. We're men of principle. <laughs> so I want to go into the. So I want to go into this and then go back into history. Like Patrick, we've talked yeah. about a few of these. I think the Alice, you've you've brought up a few more that I think are worth talking about. But mm. uh, let, I want to just do a quick theory, relate a quick theory of elite behavior from Italian sociologist Vilfredo Pareto that we could just use to hang some of these examples off. So basically. Pareto uh, said that there are some people who are more gifted than others who become elites. He doesn't mean that these people are better. It's just, for example, like the feudal aristocracy was descended from people who were very gifted at fighting. And so they were able to impose themselves as elites on others. It's not that giftedness isn't like a value judgment or I'm not yeah, reading yeah. it as a value judgment. But they were, they, you, they you were imbued with the that. necessary skills for the period. Yeah, exactly. And so and though that feudal European elite formed itself by basically... Uh, putting, uh, having a guy who maybe used to be like a like a commander of a legion or just a powerful barbarian lord, sort of plant himself in the side of a road and say, "I'm your landlord, and God said it was so." And also, I control this this mountain pass, and then created a bunch of institutions that allowed their water-headed children to never have to be threatened off of those mountain passes ever. And then that took a thousand years for Napoleon to sweep away, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It is really amazing how much of European history is just like continues like this until Napoleon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Napoleon was the Mao of his day. You know, he was the only <laughs> yeah, threat to landlords. Is that about the size of it, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I th- I think there's there is a lot of that. El- elites tend to come into being at particular at particular moments, like they have a discontinuous historical development, right? Like it's not this kind of steady process of elite emergence. You have a group of people who at a very specific point in time manage to entrench themselves. I mean, I think that's the that's kind of the common thing that for for whatever reason, for whatever kind of institutional, structural um, or or purely contingent reason, they happen to find a moment and they happen to, to kind of worm their way in. I mean, I think the Kennedys are a pretty good example of that. Like the it, like the whole reason that we have to deal with, with Kennedys now is because there was a specific moment where you could make the transition from being a uh, quasi-criminal bootlegger to having your kid become a senator. 
And that was like the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s. And so we ended up with a bunch of those guys. Oh, in the uh, UK, we're bringing that back. Don't worry. Yeah. Th- who said things are static? I mean, yeah. but the uh, but I, I think part of the difference in the United States between the US and the UK, and we like you're joking about it with the Dubai guys, but the the extent to which you have these local elites that extract surplus from their communities and do they reinvest it in the communities? Do they invest it elsewhere within the boundaries of the same country or do they take it out of the country entirely? Like where, like what are your elites doing with the resources that they've managed to extract is, is kind of a major question of political economy. And I feel like in the UK, to the extent that there are local or regional elites, they're not in any meaningful sense at all reinvesting in their communities. I, I, that's uh, not that they're doing a lot of that in the US, but they're doing slightly more. It, what this actually sort of makes me think of, right, if we want to talk about historical parallels, uh, the sort of a, an elite class that is extraordinarily extractive, but then consistently moves that extracted uh, wealth elsewhere is what, like 15th and 16th century Spain. We're just mm-hmm. like, we, we are extracting all of the wealth of the new world. We are still like taxing the shit out of our peasants. And all of that is used to just buy Germans to go kill like their friends in um in different mountain passes or to build a ridiculous baroque church in some mountain village in in Extremadura right like you just walk into some random village in Extremadura and there's um and there's like a baroque altarpiece that cost the entire annual income of a of a silver mine in South America Right. Like that's the and the, just the guy who happened to own the silver mine happened to have an estate in this village. He's like, I'd like to do something nice for my church. And yeah, that's like the you can do a lot worse in trying to understand the basics of how a political system works um, than by than by understanding the mechanisms of extraction and what they do with the money. And like, you know, local and regional elites in the U.S. aren't great about this. Like the, my hometown is a pretty good example of like the the elites there just take the money and then they spend it elsewhere for the most part. But they do still build themselves some big ass houses and they do still they like they do still sometimes patronize restaurants there. So it's not like they take all of it out. I feel like in the U.K., if you make your money in um Leicester, you're not staying in Leicester. Like no. you're you're going to you're either going to London or you're going abroad. Yeah, and London London's sort of an interesting example of that because it, you know the character of London is this strange place where like you know all of this money funnels to it both internationally and like from the UK, but it has to be like restricted in and of itself to just stuff that elites like. So that that's the reason why there's you know everything is in london and also a lot of it sucks but right? i, I want to bring it back to governing elites because what that's what i'm specifically interested in thinking about today right mm. so pareto pareto's usage governing elites encompasses all political parties anyone who could influence government not just political parties but also think tankers certain columnists journalists etc cetera, etc cetera, right and the what the what he's interested in is how often does this population rotate How many new people or even new ideas or whatever come in and how often do they go out? You know, and um, and these rotations and squabbles, right, are not just about um, the facts of things, but they're about psychosocial propensities and governing styles. Right. They are about the ways in which you decide to emotionally relate to what you're doing. Are you a sort of more are you a consensus builder? Are you a conqueror? Things of that nature. Um, Mm. And. Or in and then are you a nice old man who likes making jam? Yeah. Or are you a um, are do you are there certain beliefs that become necessary for membership in that elite that might work at that might work again? I don't mean work in terms of are good for everyone, just work in terms of the furtherance of that elite's goals or the goals of their real constituents, right? Um, I, will those ideas stop working? For example, will con- will uh, conditions change, and then all of a sudden that doesn't work anymore, right? Mm. Um, and you know, I think like just even throughout history, right? I want to start thinking about it, about elite formation and deformation. I think Patrick, you gave me a really good example about uh, the kingdom of Israel and Judah in the Iron Age. Yeah, so this is this is kind of a, a perhaps a, a seemingly strange place to take this discussion. But so the the elites of especially the kingdom of Judah, which is where we get uh, prior to the uh, prior to the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 587, 586 BC, somewhere in there, the elite of the kingdom of Judah, which is responsible for a lot of the core biblical texts 
um, that that assign Yahweh primacy among the the pantheon, like the idea that Yahweh is the the most important God, the one who's supposed to be worshipped above all others. The the corollary to that was the special relationship between Yahweh, the people of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and the house of David. So the the, the ruling dynasty that had controlled the kingdom of Judah for a few centuries here. And but he was really people, good at fighting giants. He, that's, so he that's, be, yeah. that's exactly it. I mean, these, you, the, the stories that we have about these people exist because there was a concerted elite interest in collecting, writing down and, and transmitting the stories as a, as a kind of a, this thing of self-legitimation, right? So Why has David got to be in charge? Why have I got to pay ground rent to David? <laughs> Listen, you fucking toilet. Do you see Goliath around here anywhere? Do you? <laughs> have you seen fucking Goliath recently? Where is that prick? That's right. Nowhere to be fucking seen, sunshine. Now shut up. This is this is I mean, but this there's a there's a lot to this, right? This kind of like protection racket esque idea of of how an elite comes into being. A hundred percent. That's that's exactly right. Like there and so but it's nice if you come into being as a protection racket to come up with some sort of bigger ideological justification for you to be in charge, right? Like this is one of the core pieces of uh, of the development of an elite is it's not enough to just like have the swords. You have to have a reason why, um, you know, somebody says it's okay for you to have the swords. Like you've got to have both aspects of that. And in Judah- We've got all these swords, but I'm hearing scary stuff about these pens that the other geezers have got. We've got to sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it works with pens too like if you like you take the the elite of ancient egypt which defined itself by being literate right there and there's like a kind of a magical um religious power that goes along with literacy um the pen and the sword are, are they're flip sides of the same coin of le uh, elite legitimation um and so in judah anyway what you get and the reason why this is a really fun example of um elite ossification is the, the the elite of judah continuously tells themselves this story about how they're the favorite of yahweh and how yahweh is protecting them from all comers and like the assyrians invade but they don't destroy jerusalem and then the assyrians invade again invade again and they don't destroy jerusalem and then the egyptians come and they invade but they don't destroy jerusalem and like the house of david is still kind of sitting up there on the hill like managing to to win Wait these things out. And then the Babylonians come and they're like, well, we could probably wait this out. Yahweh's got our back. And then it turns out that Yahweh does not, in fact, have their back. And he uh, the, Jerusalem was wiped off the face of the map. The house of David is destroyed. And most of the population of Judah either leaves or is exiled to Babylon for, you know, the next 80 ish years. Right. Like, so that's a really good example of how their beliefs. I, I mean, they were in a pretty tough situation politically, but their beliefs about who was protecting them and the kind of inevitability of their position at the top of this small regional, pretty unimportant kingdom is what uh, leads directly to their destruction because they've told themselves this story. They've bought into it. Um, and then it turns out, like, if you've got 20,000 Babylonian siege engineers, then you're probably not going to survive. I'm getting a lot of pushback about this Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonians thing. A lot of people are saying, David... We trusted you. <laughs> Look, I said I could sort out Goliath. I never said anything about Amurabi. Okay, <laughs> so, different geese are very different priorities. But this is, I think, this is a great example of a belief that's a a belief that is useful and useful to propagate for one th reason, which is my rule is divinely um, divinely inspired, and moreover, you can rely on my connection and personal relationship with God. Uh, to hmm. protect us, and so we don't need to do anything else. The um, that's a useful belief if you don't actually believe it. <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. Or it's, or it's, <laughs> it's useful in one way, but it's like deeply self-sabotaging in another way. And the thing that it reminds me of more than anything is austerity, like we were just hmm. talking about, where it's like it's very, very legitimizing. You can be like, we are the adults in the room. We know how to operate the economy. Yeah. We're making the tough decisions, and then the tough decisions make everything much worse. Hmm. Yeah, and, and then suddenly you're Rishi Sunak, and you're going, Yahweh has gone woke. <laughs> yeah, well, so this is, but, but this is a great example because management of the economy and beliefs about the economy have taken on a lot of the characteristics of how older power structures used to talk about um, the supernatural, the gods, the, mm, uh, enacting the, the will of the gods. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, I, I think there's a, I think there's a lot to that, that uh, we use a lot of the same kind of moralistic 
language or the idea of like, we've got to figure out what the economy wants or what the economy needs, and we've got to appease it somehow, right? Like, I think there's there's a lot of overlap in terms of how, you know, Egyptian kings talked about discerning the will of Amun-Ra and going along with it and the way that political leaders today talk about discerning the will of the economy and and helping that along. I th- Liz I, I Truss think- is not seeing the field of reeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the land of Sejin B, or mistress of Sejin B. Um, he's not. Uh, oh, he's <laughs> fucking furious that you've stained his bathrobe. <laughs> yeah, well, and so, but this is the when you have these kind of quasi-religious or or overtly religious sets of beliefs about the proper order of the world and your key role in maintaining that proper relationship, maintaining that proper sense of order in the world, it's really easy to get locked into um, a kind of exclusionary way of understanding things where you just like write off all the evidence that doesn't agree with your priors and you you have no incentive to question your priors at all or to question the assumptions that make you the person who makes the decisions and makes you important. Like, why would you? Right. Like it's the the iron law of institutions. Right. Like there you're you're more likely to try to retain power in a dying institution than admit that there's something wrong with the institution itself. Oh, that's not the iron law that I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also you say, okay, well, how do how do the how do elite groups that perpetuate themselves that are able to continue to serve their own interests, how do they avoid doing this? And the answer is they never avoid it forever. Right. Yeah. Mm. And this is the only way that elite groups throughout history have avoided doing this is by rotating, by, by going through that process of rotation, because it's precisely that process of rotation um, that uh, prevents these beliefs from sticking. The problem is, is that every, um, is that every one of these elite groups doesn't want, everyone in there doesn't want to rotate out of it. And so the, there is an extraordinary amount of defensiveness. Right of um, <laughs> shut the fuck up before I come back there and rotate your elite group. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> indeed, that sounds and incredibly so, sexual. And so <laughs> yes. getting my elite groups rotated. Yeah. yeah. So right, the movements of like non-elite to elite positions and vice versa actually it it tends to slow down over time between sort of big, not necessarily cataclysmic, but very sort of large changes, the ends and beginnings of long cycles. Like you could see. The, uh, the Six-Day War, the energy crisis, and the birth of neoliberalism as the production of one elite cycle where a lot of old um, sort of New Deal or progressives in the States or where like the old generation of the Labour Party in this country started getting filtered out of those institutions and we got instead the Atari Democrats in the States who were sort of key to uh, the like the um, like Clintonism and, and, and Clintonian third wayism. And then at the same time, you get the that's the birth of new labor here after the, the failure of Michael Foote. Like these are moments, moments of of, of elite of, of cataclysm that produce changes that, that rotate in new elites. And those elites have essentially defended in the UK, have defended their position so well from the last time there was any chance of elite rotation in 2017 and 19. Like that really, like from the perspective of elite theory, what 2017 and 19 were was an opportunity to rotate in new elites who didn't have all of the credentialing and checking processes that made sure they would be, um, uh, 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 they, they would work in accordance with those uh, pre-existing elites, right? They were going to come in through another door and, and be actually, again, from the perspective of just does the, is the elite able to do what it does for itself, actually probably save it from itself. So, so what you're saying is that Britain is having a sort of like a long 1830s, right? Where we're like, everyone knows that the system is unsustainable, um, but nothing is happening. Mm. Well, if you can't, part of, part of becoming, it, part of getting yourself into a position of being in charge is you cannot believe the system is unsustainable. Mm-hmm. But that's what, and that's the core, and we, if we talk about the belief that is ossified, it is basically a belief about public investment. And the... And again, even if it is public investment as the U.S. did by just spraying down small business tyrants with money, that's still some kind of investment which we're still failing to do and failing on our on their own terms. 
Wet um, tyrant contest. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we the way of wetting the tyrants that we've discovered is, uh, you know, what we've been calling productivism. This kind of like newer, like refinement of, of sort of like capitalist but, ideology. But right? we can't do we're it. Just kind of, we're not doing <laughs> yeah, it. No, we're just doing the old stuff still. I really want an episode called "Wetting the Tyrant." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, let's. Um, we can call this one that. Yeah. yeah. But like, we can. I, I want to think think a little more about like maybe. Um, the, one of the suggestions you had, Alice, was uh, talking about Venice in this context, where again they oh, defended themselves. Oh yes, so this is this is just to. Sorry, to I think about Charles Snow a great deal lately. I think about his his lecture, "The Two Cultures," a great deal. Um, and there's a bit in it in which he sort of like recapitulates the the Iron Law of institutions. Um, which, if you if you'll permit me, I can just read the whole thing. It's like two paragraphs. The bitterness is it is nothing like enough. To say we have to educate ourselves or perish is a little more melodramatic than the facts warrant. And I interrupt here to say that this was written in 1959. So, to say that we have to educate ourselves or watch a steep decline in our own lifetime is about right. We can't do it, I am now convinced, without breaking the existing pattern. I know how difficult this is. It goes against the emotional grain of nearly all of us. In many ways, it goes against my own, standing uneasily with one foot in a dead or dying world, and the other in a world that at all costs we must see born. I wish I could be certain that we shall have the courage of what our minds tell us. More often than I like, I am saddened by a historical myth. Whether the myth is good history or not doesn't matter, it's pressing enough for me. I can't help thinking of the Venetian Republic in their last half century. Like us, they had been fabulously lucky. They had become rich as we did, by accident. They had acquired immense political skill, just as we have. A good many of them were tough-minded, realistic, patriotic men. They knew, just as clearly as we know, that the current of history had begun to flow against them. Many of them gave their minds to working out ways to keep going. It would have meant breaking the pattern into which they had crystallized. They were fond of the pattern, just as we are fond of ours. They never found the will to break it. What am I supposed to do? Create some kind of new society in a lagoon? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think it's it's worth asking, right? Like this is the the situation Alice outlined. Patrick, can you go into a little more of like what the actual dynamics were that caused accidentally invented too many councils of like numbers of dudes? Yeah, that yeah. caused Venice to be unable to sustain itself when theoretically it probably could have continued going on, not as it was, but certainly not with such a dramatic fall. Yeah, I, so the, the Venetian political system is fascinating uh, because it comes into being over very long periods of development that are punctuated by these these moments of absolute fucking crisis, right? Like where they so the Venetian elite is first and foremost a mercantile elite. They make their money by doing trade and by doing money things and by building boats and like because it's fucking Venice. And like right like so you're you're doing you're doing maritime trade. And this is the case for, you know, up until the beginning of the 15th century, but the Venetian elite at various points has to fend off challenges from people who are lower down the social scale and at various points, they make decisions to pull up the ladder of entry into the elite after them. Um, so there comes a point where no matter how much money you're going to make, unless you're married into the right families, you're never going to have any sort of political influence or political power, political authority. And the Venetian elite turns out to be pretty good at maintaining its own position because they shift their investment as it becomes more difficult to trade in the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, because the Ottomans are coming up. They're like, well, you know, we've got the Po Valley right here and we've got a ton of money and we can hire mercenaries and we can fight, you know, land wars in Italy pretty much to our heart's content because we have the resources to do it. We can hire the best mercenaries from all over the place. And this is what they do. So they kind of turn their attention from holding an overseas empire to building, you know, a land based state in northern Italy that's still centered on Venice. And the Venetian political elite benefits from this over and over and over again, like they they managed to pretty smoothly transition from one form of um, maritime empire to a more terrestrial one in what happens to be one of the richest and most densely populated areas of, of Europe. Right. So they basically just trade one form of extractive control for another um, and, and manage to and manage to remain rich. And they do this for centuries. They managed to they managed to kind of retain this right up until the point when Italy becomes the playground for the great powers of the 16th century. Um, 
And they've got a, and you know, Venice's elite remains rich. They, they, they managed to carve out their place in this continuing order in which Italy is basically controlled by, by much larger powers with, with uh, their, their bases elsewhere. The Venetian elite manages to continue going on. And so like a lot of the palazzi that you still see in Venice are built after the point of Venice's maximum, um, actual power and authority as a state, right? They're built in the 16th, 17th century because Venice's elite are still rich as hell because they've still got well, land in the states. Coin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine if, it, yeah. I mean, imagine if you just got rich at some point a couple of centuries before and you've managed to remain rich because you're, you know, you're not expanding your business, but you're not like losing enough to where you can't build a new palazzo if you want it. Uh, and so Venice's elite manages to just kind of pivot from thing to thing throughout these periods of, of really deep structural change. Eventually, they just turn Venice into a tourist destination and they remain rich from that because they're catering to, you know, elites from elsewhere doing the grand tour and coming to get some culture. And, you know, they've, they've got opera houses now and they're going to get rich off that. They're going to get rich off running high end, uh, like uh, uh, like running operations of high end courtesans. Um, so Venice's elite manages to, without incorporating almost any new blood for several centuries manages to remain rich right up until the point when finally the structures have changed too much. And it's like, well, we would need to be doing something fundamentally different and they can never get there. Mm. So effectively, mm. Ven the story of Venice up until basically what Italian unification is a story of an elite that is able to, uh, that is able to recognize that it, that it, that it, it cannot maintain all of its beliefs forever. It it is in fact an example of an elite that manages to avoid ossification. Mm. Yeah, it's they they are, they're really flexible for a really long time, right up until they would have to make that final break, which comes more or less with Napoleon, right? And so first with Napoleon, and then with their incorporation into the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 19th century, like right up until that point, Venice's elite manages to do a pretty good job. And then, but then, you know, as with everything, it always comes back to Napoleon, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I, I guess my question is, how do you, because well, this is, if most elites mostly fail most of the time, they had a, a very good run for a very long time of, and more importantly, uh, through... Learning the wrong lesson from this, all of our elites have to start wearing carnival masks. <laughs> <laughs> more, and not just at the parties. Um, no. <laughs> so, but they have. Uh, Liz to, Truss has yeah. absolutely worn some carnival masks. <laughs> in her I, was, life. I think the quest, the interesting question there, right, is what accounts for their unusual level of success in maintaining the thing that makes them elites as a going concern? Is is it that they're they're because they're not accepting new people, but they're clearly able to observe the world around them and pivot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I I think there's an important distinction in elite behaviors between being really invested in the idea of being an elite and the idea of basing your elite position on on some sort of legitimating thing. I think the what made the Venetian elite um, so effective for so long was that they just wanted to be rich and powerful and make decisions, and they didn't really care all that much what the basis for that was. I mean, mm. they were pretty... Swiss uh, vibes. Yeah, I mean, honestly, they they didn't really care whether they were making their money off of slave trading or grain trading, or um, or hiring out mercenaries or serving or or acting as bankers or controlling landed estates or hosting tourists. They didn't really care so long as they got to maintain their position, which is not true of a lot of elites. A lot of elites get really invested in the specific thing that makes them rich and powerful at a particular moment. Well, that's Snow's anxiety here, and that's what leads him yeah. to this sort of like mm -hmm. uh, misunderstanding of Venetian history, right? Is to make it like his anxiety for Britain in 1959, which is it's not that you know the Venetian Republic is going to sink into the ocean, it's not that it's you know its elites are going to be poor, it's that it stops being the Venetian Republic, yeah, right? That's the sort of the, that's the worry, and that the same is going to happen to to us and to our elites is that you know the the UK is not going to be. Uh, as independent, as sort of like as polar as it is. Classical education ass anxiety. I've just yeah, I've got, genuinely. I've just got this joke like burrowing into my head like a brain parasite. So I'll share it with you. <laughs> it's the fucking it's the Kevin Hart meme, and it's like this. <laughs> This is this is Venice, bitch. We clown in this motherfucker. You better take your <laughs> sensitive ass back to Ravenna. 
Give give me a Photoshop of Kevin Hart as Enrico Dandolo are doing that, oh please and thank you. Oh, yeah. that's so and, good. And so you can even you can also take it again as like as sort of most theories of because most theories of elite behavior tend to be sociological, and so they t mm. they think about the individuals who come into these institutions, not just the anxieties about say the country, and so you say okay, well. Are and, and I think in the U in the UK and that's not in the US as well, right? You got like the West Wing disease where everyone wants to be in the room where it happens. But there is, I think the the reverence of the people for their own positions in the UK, I think is a, actually a big um, it is a big determinant of why our elites are individually so uniquely incapable. Like why they are so uniquely unable to bring in new information because ever, ever yeah. since like the Second World War, at the absolute latest, we have been sort of like obsessed with this idea of punching above our weight. And ever since like decolonization and like again, absolute latest, latest, right? We've had this sort of like elite uh, neurosis where it's like, okay, we can see everything's not going the way we want it to but we have to like sort of maintain maintain both the position and the appearance of it right and then and then i i think you can then say okay well things like questions of economic management well you're no longer managing the economy of 25 percent of the world sure you are still managing the economy of a very large one that many millions of people live in those questions take on less of a substance right and take on more of a performance you know, so mm. West Streeting is West Streeting does not understand. I believe I, I believe personally that West Streeting does not understand. And if he did understand and cared, he wouldn't be in that position, right? Whoever is in West Streeting's position has to not understand the relationship between, say, um, like staffing technology and health outcomes. They have to not understand or perform not understanding that you can just reform your way into a bare bone service with one nurse somehow treating the whole country. Right. You, you have to believe that or perform your belief of it. And and this is, I, I think, related to the um, the idea of being value, as you as you sort of alluded to earlier, Patrick, valuing not just being powerful, being in control of, of something, but values this the seriousness of the position values being applauded and welcomed into these institutions by your fellows who are increasingly only talking to one another. I mean, we talk on this show about AIs slowly losing power because they start taking on information generated by other generative AI models. You know, it's the same kind of um, sort of Habsburg, Habsburgian uh, or mad cow even. The British elite gave themselves leadership prions, is what you're saying. Essentially, yeah, it is a kind of, pri it's a kind of prionic condition where they're all eating from the same trough that they're also all filling with themselves. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's it's the human centipede of political thought, and this is and and you know this goes it, you can so is as, as circulation into and through that elite becomes closed and separate, even separate from its economic elites, right? There is no well, that, that, that was Brexit. Like, not to be too lib about this, but to do this sort of like acts of prestige based self harm, right? And you know when you look then at. Uh, all right, well, a, a, an elite that is closed off from the people it's supposed to serve, not again, not you and me, but business, right? And it is increasingly uh, sort of enraptured with its own institutions, with the Spectator Garden Party, the various like uh, uh, prestigious schools that you're supposed to go to, the fact that they've all, these people have all been friends forever. The fact that, you know, labor is mostly interested in selecting um, for its future rising stars, to go back to streeting, for example, someone who's never had a fucking real job, uh, other than just working for the party, or as its new um, as its new parliamentary candidates, people up and down the country uh, are just being parachuted in from Westminster. You know, it's a oh, you're you're going to be selected as the MP for you know for somewhere in the West Midlands. Great, we've got a guy who spent his entire life living in Camden who's never met anyone here. Oh, literally, the guy you're talking about, the guy who's uh, running for Nadine Doris' seat in Mid Bedfordshire. Uh, I I saw him described by an unnamed senior Labour source as. Uh, perfect for it because he was half farmer, half banker, and I was like, <laughs> "You, you could have like put that word for word in the Roman Empire, like easily." <laughs> oh, the, I, I think as we're talking about this, I feel like one of the fundamental differences between the U.S. 
and the UK is that 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 class of people does exist in the United States, but they tend to get funneled into very specific areas of government, right? Like especially mm. the US foreign policy establishment is full of those fucking people who all went to the Harvard School of Government and it, you know, the American legal establishment very much like that too, right? Like very much full of these people who attended these same three institutions and they all know each other and they all are, are deeply in love with, uh, you know, the smelling their own farts brand of uh, brand of doing government. Um, but most American governance is not in the hands of those people, right? Like they have their very specific um, purviews and remits. And but most American government is like um, fat guys in polo shirts. <laughs> like that's the that's the that's the American political class. Uh, and so you have when when you see these failures in American governance, they tend to be in the areas of in the areas where those people are are most prominent. They tend to be in foreign policy. They tend to be in in the law they tend to be supreme court like shit like that and then you hear like the pious bleedings of the class of people who have come up um socialized to those institutional norms um the, but that's all politics in the uk it mm -hmm. seems to me that's 100 like, no percent of it there there is no counterbalance to there that. is there is no and and that's what i mean right when i when I, you think about the us there is in terms of the people who are actually in power Right. It's still an elite that still governs for itself, but it is able to it is able to sustain itself more effectively. And again, not super well. I mean, they did just get a credit downgrade. The global reserve currency shouldn't get a, a credit downgrade. Yeah, it's not good. Like, no. This is this is not I, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination point painting this as like a positive series of, of, of but, outcomes or processes. But from this from the simple fact that they were able to abandon the Trump, Obama, no investment under any circumstances consensus. And we have not been able to abandon the Blair Cameron um, and then everyone else since then um, uh, uh, that, that consensus. I think it is down to this kind of elite socialization, this kind of um, uh, prion of society, essentially. Mm. Think about this contrast, right? So there's a I can't remember. I think he's the now senator from Oklahoma, Mark Wayne Mullen. Um, he is uh, his name is Mark Wayne. Um, I don't believe he oh. has a college degree, but he is a rich kind of small businessman turned politician. Um, he's like he has hobbies like he he was an MMA fighter and he uh, he's he's very concerned about the proper treatment of of combat sports athletes. And he wants to sponsor a, a version of a, a what's called the Ali Act, which gives boxers a lot of uh, a lot more control over their careers that doesn't apply to MMA fighters. But obviously his politics are fucking horrible. He's a Republican from Oklahoma. Right. Like he's it. But. Mark Wayne Mullen, the fact that he is now a member of the federal government, right? Like he absolutely reflects the beliefs of the Oklahoma regional elite, right? That is new blood into American politics in some meaningful sense. Like now, I, do I think everything he stands for is fucking horrible? Absolutely, right? But he is actually reflective of a politically involved and politically important class of people like he is a type of guy who is there representing people who have a say in the running of the United States of America. Now, I wish they didn't, uh, but but they do. And in that way, it makes the institutions of centralized governance more responsive to what's actually happening out in the country. And I mean, I feel like if, for all of the many problems with the lack of centralization in the United States, like the weak ass federal government here, um, there, the fact that it is still filled with people who are locally or regionally prominent and are able to go to the center and, you know, be like, you know, fucking bootleg ass, uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington in the worst way possible. Uh, like that's, that's a fundamental political difference. I think that's the, Mr. Smith can go to Washington, whereas there are kind of tank lines of ideology set up to keep Mr. Smith from getting within 10 miles of Westminster. Mm. Um, th this is this. And also, I want to think as well about the the because the, the British elite, as it currently stands, didn't just spring into being fully formed. Right. The, the British elite is almost almost globally unique in its strangeness as as it emerged from the um, from the Industrial Revolution. This is from an essay by Tom Nairn on British elites from the New Left Review. 
It is often observed that all capitalist classes, as soon as their freedom of action economically is assured, become rapidly conservative in outlook. The English capitalist class, because of the peculiar circumstances attending its birth, was conservative from the outset, but did not evolve its own conservatism as the product of a unified bourgeois culture, such as in France or whatever. The perfect model of social conservatism was before its eyes in the social order of the English agrarian world. Modern English conservatism was the product, therefore, of a grafting process whereby the emergent society of industrial capitalism took this older world into itself as its head, its directing organ capable of looking after its vital interests and able to provide a kind of authority, a many-sided hegemony superior to anything that it, in its notorious crudity, could develop. So, if we think about the actual birth of the English elites in the in the 19th century, the fact that the there was no bourgeois revolution in England. There was a settlement between the aristocracy and the cap and the emerging capitalist class, where they all just sort of enmeshed with one another. Aristocrats in invested in mills, uh, and then and then the capitalists married their the emergent capitalists married their children to the sort of second and third children of the aristocrats, and you know the and accordingly the, the ideology that they developed was a kind of Almost like a, a inherited bureaucracy, inherited managerialism, feudal, uh, if aristocratic managerialism. Je this is why we have it's the, like landlord managerialism, yeah. which in itself leads to a lot of peculiarities. Well, it, it's why, for example, our con I think why I think that the British Constitution is unwritten and relies on everybody following unwritten rules. Right? What, what are you reading stuff for? Well, in case it was written by a bloke. Come on, <laughs> be serious. You are not getting your deposit back on this country. I'm yeah, sorry. I mean, but, that, but that's that is an interesting. That's a really interesting contrast because it's an elite group that develops. It's a, a really distinct sense of uh, or a distinct set of legitimating institutions that if you do these things, you too can you too can belong to this elite world. So it's a qua. It's an elite that appears on its uh, that appears to be somewhat open to new blood, as long as you go through the funnels that lead you into the elite. Right. Like there's so there's this. So that's a much more intense process of narrowing socialization than you get with elite groups elsewhere. The funnel that leads you into the elite is the funnel they piss on you through at the Skull and Bones Club. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Whereas in, in the United States, f by contrast, there are a lot of different sets of educational institutions, right? Like if, if you, if you are a local elite in Arizona, right, where, where I now live, chances are good that you went to Arizona State University, right? Like this is a, you are, and you know, the other um, blonde sorority girls who went to Arizona State University who are married to local car dealers and lawyers. And like, like you've all grown up and you've all gone to school together. And there is a local and regional kind of nexus of wealth power and political authority right? arizona like politics media and the professions is dominated by the cabal the mafia of people who went to phoenix university online <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean but that's a think about the difference between that there is no there is no uk equivalent to that i don't think right like you would you would just if closest you closest is the devolved nations like the university of glasgow in scotland maybe yeah like you would you would if you were had aspirations to become more you would go to you would go to one of those centralizing institutions and you would become a product of that and you would be socialized to that worldview whereas it's entirely possible to you know if you're from the Seattle suburbs to go to the University of Washington join a fraternity at the University of Washington and then go back to your Seattle exurb and run things there right like that's an entirely possible path where you have stayed entirely within that region and never left it and maybe you've moved elsewhere for a little while, but like you haven't been socialized through a centralizing institution. Mm. So it's the closest thing we have to like American Zaibatsus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think that's a I think that's a really good uh, I, th I think that's a really good parallel. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna level with everyone. I don't know what a Zaibatsu is. It's Japanese for big company. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway, anyway, we're we're at about time, but uh, Patrick, it's always a pleasure to have you on uh, to talk about uh, the historical and geographical parallels between things, and try to use the um, or sorry, well, I try to use the uh, the comparative method to suss uh, try to suss out something uh, true about our political uh, environment, uh, and others uh, yell over me. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, that's right. But, but that's precisely the dynamic that keeps me coming back is the, the really <laughs> earnest mm. attempt to learn something followed by uh, followed by bits. Yeah, like, yeah. Don't, don't like it. Go form a more equitable podcast than the Lagoon. <laughs> you know, before we end, I wanted to say I realize I, I, I'm sure Patrick has I bothered you about the Venice thing a lot. I like talking and thinking about Venice. Mm. I was trying to think of the foundation myth of Venice for an episode a couple of months ago. And I, while listening back, I got it very wrong. But while listening back to your podcast in Tides of History from a couple of years ago on the foundation of Venice, I realized that every single thing I said was something I remembered from that podcast and put together in a spectacularly <laughs> wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the problem with the oral transmission of information is it yeah. is intensely subject to reimagining. Riley's is... like a Homeric bard. <laughs> yeah. Sing the muses He's... of the lagoon. Nope. <laughs> but that's, that's what they did. They they like they took these yeah. set piece. They took these little set piece things and then built a story around it. And then you went. And mm. then the next time you did it, you went back to the same set piece and put it together in an entirely different way. And that's the that's, that's oral culture, baby. And also, right, if people want to uh, want to learn a little more about history or perhaps uh, some new project that you're doing, where can they find that? And what might that new project be? Well, so my new project is called The Pursuit of Dadliness. It is a dad culture podcast. We're covering oh, yeah. uh, history, fitness, the master and commander novels, uh, sandwiches. Uh, yeah, I've mm. I've got multiple guests coming on <laughs> to talk about uh, to talk about the Aubrey Maturin series. So uh, like not not one, many. This is yes. this is the kind of this is the kind of content you can expect from the pursuit of dadliness. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Basically, I just wanted a chance to interview people that I like about things that I think are interesting, but that are not necessarily history. And I think dad culture is a pretty good, um, pretty good umbrella for that. So I'm oh, enjoying 100%. the heck out of it. I've already enjoyed the the conversations that I've had. I'm looking forward to having more. Um, and I'm still doing tides of history. I'm still uh, still plugging away on the Iron Age here. Yeah, I'm uh, I am listening to it at the gym. Uh, it is it is my go to gym listening. Uh, also, if you're listening to this, it is after our Edinburgh live show. So it's too late for you to come to that. But it is not too late for you to go see Milo. No, yeah, come come see my show. Uh, by the time you hear this, I may be in an advanced state of psychological decay. Uh, come watch me absolutely lose my mind at 10 past noon every day at Monkey Barrel to an audience of primarily pensioners, I presume, because who the fuck goes to a comedy show at 10 past noon <laughs> other than people who've just had discount fish and chips? So um, please do come to that and uh, help me scare some old people with a show which is primarily about death, which I imagine they will find more affecting than most. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, other than that, uh, you know the deal. Mm. The Patreon gets you a couple other more episodes. Britonology left on red. There's a stream mm. Mondays and, and Thursdays when Alice is it home. Fucking is. Uh, mm. Nine Which to I a mostly am. <laughs> I'm back now. Nine mm. to eleven UK time. Women be at home. With all that That's being right. said, I want to once again thank Patrick. Once again, thank you, mm. and we will see you in a couple of fine days. They're on the Patreon. They're giving us their dollars. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful little patrons. They're wonderful <laughs> patrons that the American people love to see. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. It is always a pleasure. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.